Once upon a time, a wicked queen created a terrible curse. I shall destroy your happiness if it is the last thing I do. That banished everyone in the enchanted forest to the town of Storybrooke, Maine, until a hero arrived. An evil queen sent a bunch of fairy tale characters here. They don't remember who they are. A hero who would fight the forces of evil as she embarked on a quest. You're our only hope. To break the curse. Now, a new day dawns in Storybrooke. Magic is coming. This season's all about how they brought magic into Storybrooke. Our characters are all going to remember their true identities. No. <gasps> and magic will be very unpredictable here. It opens the doors to so many other possibilities and storylines for our second season. You wanted to see your queen? Here she is. There's still going to be the excitement of kind of having all these fairy tales opened up and looked at from a whole new perspective. We're going to meet all sorts of other characters. Uh, right off the bat, we meet um, Aurora, who is Sleeping Beauty, and we meet Mulan. I'm very excited that Captain Hook is coming. Season two is going to be so much fun. We've been blown away by what's happening, so the fans will have to watch and see. Magic is coming. here to show you a little behind the scenes on set of Once Upon a Time. So here we have the main street. As you can see, we are not outside. It is not very glamorous. We are inside a big, giant warehouse. This is Granny's. She makes a mean lasagna and runs an inn. So I'm sure we can set you up with a room until you find a place. The place that is dearest to my heart, because I spent a lot of time here, Granny's Diner. If you look at the menu, which they never show close up, the prices in Storybrooke are amazing. Wheat toast is 69 cents. A hot dog is 79 cents. It smells good, there's no inflation in Storybrooke. This is the kitchen, so you'll have a, a chef back here, and it'll be steamy. And the way they make it steamy is they just boil a kettle of water, and then it looks like there's cooking going on back here, which is, I think, pretty fancy. So here we are in the wardrobe room, which is a very, very fun room to come and visit. This is where all of the beautiful costumes that you see in Fairytale Land, in Storybrooke, and everywhere on the show, they all get made here by these amazing people. There's Ruby behind us on the pilot, which... Oh my which, gosh, I haven't seen this picture. They made this dress yeah. in a day. Yeah. yeah, that was Mulan, that's Mulan. And all of this was handmade. She has this amazing cape. Oh, that's so pretty. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for me. Thanks for hanging out with me on set of Once Upon a Time. Welcome to Steveston, the real storybook. With Storybrooke, it was really about how do we make a town feel distressed, but also feel like a place you, you, you want to be and that you want to root for. We were looking to find a town that was just kind of stuck in time. We wanted Storybrooke to look like a place that maybe a hundred years ago was vibrant, but now it's kind of faded and decayed. So we surveyed a lot of small towns in and around the Vancouver area, and we landed on this town, Steveston, mostly because it hadn't been touristed up. There's something about the atmosphere of the village of Steveston. It's uh, blue collar. It's somewhat gritty. This was a fishing village, first and foremost. Uh, we're in the southwest corner uh, of the island, so it's truly a destination point. So when you drive to Steveston, you're either coming out here to visit someone or coming out to as a tourist to come and check it out, or you live here. Well, I've lived here for 20 years, and it hasn't really changed that much. It's always been this nice, quiet, little, sweet town, and it's really family-oriented, a great community. I raised my two kids here. When you see the car drive down that main street and the activities on some of the main streets here in the village of Steveson, it, it just works somehow. It just all fits together. 
The art department starts early in the morning, adding signs and dressing windows to transform this town into Storybrooke. Basically, it's, it's, it's a process where a team of probably about a dozen guys go out there the day before we shoot, and they transform this town. So to change Deedston over to Storybrooke, it takes about 10 hours of work. Uh, the set decorators, the construction, and uh, the paint department all come in and change over the signs, the windows. They dress uh, the cafe as Granny's Cafe and change the street signs and any uh, other things that need to be Storybrooke. Every place you go to, the people are different and they, they want you to help set them back up when you're done or, you know, some of them just want to do it themselves. We just communicate with them to find out sort of, you know, what, what's easier for them and what is the least intrusive. And that way we, uh, we all get along. Oh, they're very fast. They come in the morning and they're very well organized. Everybody knows what they're doing. The crew are very nice people and they change the sign and they put it in Granny's Diner and they're changing the tables outside and they transform to a different place. We double as a uh, shoe store. They come in and do this amazing transformation, in particular on the outside of the building, with uh, covering our signage and enhancing uh, things to make it look uh, unified for them. And then we take out our product out of the front window, and we've got quite a system going now. Uh, we can turn it around pretty quick. They come in, uh, next thing you know, it's done, and uh, the shoot's going, and uh, the next day it's back to normal. So they become family every day. We see them come in, and, and uh, it's been great. Steveston serves as a backdrop to our show, but it is also a thriving community that has stories of its own. And is this a gift? Yes. All our jewelry is Canadian jewelry. It's not a back lot, and these are businesses and people have livelihoods, so we don't shut them down when we're shooting. The stores stay open, and the people have been very friendly. Nick down at the bread shop there, um, he's, he's quite the character. My name is Nick Constantin. Uh, I came here six years ago, and I built a brick oven and uh, started baking European uh, country breads. People might think, uh, well, why one bread? And I thought this is the way it should be. <laughs> the manager showed up at uh, the door, and he said, well, we like your location. We'd like to introduce in our uh, show. And then they uh, put their sign up there. My store is a bakery, and their sign is also designs a bakery. So uh, it works out well. When they first started coming, one of the managers suggested that I make some ice creams according to the characters, and that has been almost a weekly challenge, trying to figure out, okay, what flavor for the next character? She has a flavor for Prince Charming, Snow White. I think she even has a flavor for Once Upon a Time altogether. Once Upon a Time, it was real sprigs of thyme and poach them in honey and then cook them in a custard. And I have to say that's a very, very good one. When they first started shooting, we had whole new customers coming in because all these people were seeing all this old vintage stuff in the window were coming in the door and then going, it's toys. We thought it was all vintage stuff. So uh, that was kind of funny. Tourists coming in want to come to Steveson to sample the flavors that it has because they, they've seen it on the television show. It must be a great place. And what is it in real life? They come to see that. I had a lady phone yesterday, she asked me where the tower of the, of the clock is. The clock tower is part of a building, but it's also part visual effects. The whole clock tower itself is about a 20-foot structure which mounts on top of a real building, and that's all visual effects. People come down the street almost every day and say, when is that pawn shop open? I have never seen it open. And I have to say, well, I'm sorry, but that's actually a movie set, and uh, it will never open. <laughs> On the weekends, it's very busy with people with the cameras and telephones shooting pictures and everything. What the hell are you doing? We get such support from everybody. People come out and they watch filming all the time and they seem to really respond to the show. So, you know, we couldn't shoot this show anyplace else now. Once the show was on the air and people saw it, I think they were so great and so welcoming and so excited by the show that it was like, it was just an incredible response. I love the changes that the set has made because um, it makes me fall in love with my town all over again. So I go home and uh, I get lost in the show because I, uh, I see my town and it's beautiful. Snow White, 
In Storybrooke, she's a teacher named Mary Margaret Blanchard, but in Fairytale Land, she's the fairest one of all. Pretty, right? Oh, and one more thing. She's a total badass. Just like the story goes, her stepmother, the evil queen, is out to kill her. Why is the queen doing this? I destroyed her happiness. And now she wants to destroy mine. While Snow White is on the run from the evil queen and living as a thief in the forest, she robs Prince Charming. They can't stand each other at first, but after saving each other's lives, the spark of romance strikes. Will you marry me? Too bad Charming's dad wants him dead. Release the blade. And Snow's stepmom wants her dead. I shall destroy your happiness. Parents just don't understand. Charming is captured by the Queen, and she forces Snow White to take a bite of that infamous poisoned apple. Snow falls into an endless sleep, until Charming escapes and breaks the curse with true love's kiss. That kiss leads to marriage, and that marriage leads to a beautiful baby girl named Emma. And they lived happily ever. Nope. The evil queen enacts the dark curse that will transport everyone to a land where there are no happy endings. But before the queen can cast the spell, Snow White and Prince Charming use a magic vessel to protect Emma from the curse and get their newborn daughter to safety. She got away. You're going to lose. I know that now. So season two is about to finish. That's exciting. Yes, it's crazy. So what can you tease about what's coming up for your character? Well, I can tell you that tonight, in tonight's episode, Mary Margaret, David, and the Blue Fairy team up and are racing Regina and her mother Cora for Rumpelstiltskin's dagger. The dagger, of course, establishes the Dark One. Um, in flashback, we're going to find out how Young Snow's mother died. Tonight's episode guest stars Leslie Nichols, Downton Abbey. Lots of good things going on. And uh, do you find that Snow White and Prince Charming are sort of going to reconcile their differences in terms of where to live? I hope so. I think so. They will continue to face obstacles. There will continue to be conflicts. But I believe in the power of their teamwork. Thank you so much. Up. I'm not sure you're ready. Ready for some fairy tales? They're not fairy tales. They're true. Every story in this book actually happened. Of course it did. Once Upon a Time is a show where every fairy tale character and every storybook character you've ever known is actually real and actually exists. You should know more than anyone. Why is that? Because you're in this book. Oh, kid. You've got problems. Yep, and you're gonna fix them. I play Emma Swan. Emma is sort of dragged to Storybrooke, Maine. An evil queen sent a bunch of fairy tale characters here. Yeah, and now they're trapped. So when they are banished from the enchanted forest in fairy tale land, they are sent to reality in Storybrooke, Maine. I'd like a room. <laughs> Welcome to Storybrooke. Thanks. The town itself has so many mysteries and so many things to unlock, and now you have this woman living in a town that has very, very deep, dark secrets. And there's a built-in conflict between the evil queen, who is the mayor of Storybrooke, and Emma. I suggest you get in your car and you leave this town. Because if you don't, I will destroy you if it is the last thing I do. People think fairy tales are for kids. <laughs> but this is fairy tale characters in grown-up situations. ABC's Once Upon a Time series premiere Sunday, October 23rd. What is your message for the fans as they get ready to watch the rest of the season? Oh, um, I don't know. I mean, I listen. I would just say I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys are taken by surprise and and have a great time. And the, I, we have the best fans in the world. We honestly do. We have the most loyal, incredible, excited, lovely fans. They make us feel like this is worth it every day, and um, they make us feel really special so thank you to you guys because that's because of you. Ready? Yeah, let's go. There's all kinds of milestones in life. The kind you expect to live through and there's the kind you never dreamed you'd get to live through. We are one. And that's the best kind of all.
we approached the show at first at the pilot stage at just kind of our, you know, our wish list of what we would want to do. And then we were very fortunate to be able to have an incredible effects team that never said no, that just said, okay, let's figure out how to do it all. Adam and Eddie and the writing team are so good at thinking up these absolutely fantastic situations and they'll write on a page, the scene opens and Geppetto and Pinocchio are cast in the middle of a storm, the giant whale lurking in the background. Hold on, my boy! I'm trying, Father! A lot of people I don't think realize that they only have a couple weeks to pull this off and you can spend three weeks on a scene like that. We had our actor Geppetto on the raft in a tank. And that performance that we got from him with the wind and the rain and the fans and everything is very visceral and very real. I think we had four Ritter fans and rain towers and smoke and water cannons and we had wave machines to make waves on the water. Their water in that sequence, for example, only goes 60 feet out. So they're setting the tone, they're setting the look of the water, and we're replicating that all the way through. We were able to comp in the little boy later in motion capture. We had the real boy do a temp recording on video so that we could see his facial expressions. And then those facial expressions were actually used in the modeling of the wooden puppet. We had a lot of very heavy visual effects. We had water, we had rain, we had virtual characters, we had motion capture characters, we had keyframe characters, we had virtual sets. It really showed the depth and the breadth of the kind of work that we do. No, Father! You take it! Save yourself! Pinocchio! One of the big preparations we need to do is which sets are going to be virtual and which sets are going to be practical. And either way, Michael Joy and his art department and I are working together to decide how we're going to create this world. If there's something that has to be designed, I do a little cartoon and then it's pre-visualized by artists who make a full color illustration. And that's sort of how we communicate with pictures. I say we fight! We do a lot of virtual sets on Once Upon a Time, hence this large green screen stage here. The War Room is a virtual set. We have large practical components, a table for set dressing and that the actors can sit around and perform around, some columns, but everything else is virtual. Amongst all the people who are talking in this very kind of intense moment are Jiminy Cricket, who's three inches of insect sitting on the table, and Blue Fairy, who's hovering in the middle of the table, also talking back and forth. Two very different visual effects techniques Blue Fairy is shot on a very sophisticated flying rig. So what we did was we shot with a little light on the end of a fishing line that was moving from place to place so that everybody's eye line could be right. And then after the fact, we went back to the stage and on green screen, we played back that sequence. Stunts programmed this flying rig so that she flew to the correct place as she was going from spot to spot to spot in the scene. And then we were able to extract her and put her Blue Fairy sparkles on her and put her wings on her and integrate her back into the scene. This will work. The audience can see you looking at something. They're going to assume it's really there. You just let your imagination kind of run wild when you're on the green screen. build this large green screen stage with basically just floor components and a couple of wall components. Uh, we had the coffin on set. There were huge bouldery rocks and things for me to run on and jump on and hide behind. So having the physicality of those things built into that green screen space made it very easy for me. And then interestingly, because the camera was on a huge crane, the camera almost felt like the dragon. I was always looking near where the camera was and it looks like this giant head on this big crane moving. So there was sort of an element of, you know, the technical stuff that was going on that actually really aided me from an emotional perspective of reacting to something. When I was running across the balcony, I would jump over and I would land on this huge thing and it was automated, so it was on hydraulics and that was the dragon's neck that I was holding around. It was just the best. It was like I was at a rodeo. We shot a bunch of elements of flame going from different angles, from the side, from the front, to the back, that we could use to composite in with our CG character so that the real fire was there with them. It's really interesting because you dream up something and then you actually get to see it brought to life. 
you must trust me. Because if you don't, there are other ways. Another type of visual effect that we do on our show are the visual effects that exemplify magic. We've strived to make the magic in the show be something that comes from an organic place. When Evil Queen throws fire, she pulls the fire from a fireplace and gathers it up and then throws it. When she wants to subdue somebody, she takes the armaments from around her and brings them together and throws them at the person. One of her abilities is to naturally control the environment around her. When Hansel and Gretel try to run away, the roots of the tree come up and grab them and bind them together. She's able to control the, the real things that are in real fairy tale land, and it really speaks to the overall idea that Adam and Eddie have so brilliantly created for the show that for the people who live in fairy tale land, fairy tale land's real. And I'm constantly blown away by what they're capable of with special effects on this show. They just do such a great job. What we've learned is that it's a question of planning. The more we know what we're gonna do, the more we can achieve. It takes a huge amount of effort from everybody, from the writers to the producers to the directors to make it all happen. Five years ago, we couldn't have done this show. The, the technology has advanced at such an incredible rate that the stuff that can be achieved on a weekly basis is mind-boggling now. Tonight, I will have my vengeance. Go inside the world of Storybrooke with exclusive insight from the show's creators. An all-new special Once Upon a Time, The Price of Magic. Then Sunday, April 21st, the countdown begins. The first of three new episodes and a brand new hero. He goes by Robin Hood. It's all leading to the spellbinding final hour of the season. Storybrooke isn't safe. Once Upon a Time, Sundays at 8, 7 central on ABC. Challenges for me, and well, I, I pick roles generally that you know have a challenge. There's one there too, because um, that's you know that's what I love about this job is to be able to play that role, that role, that role, that role, and for nothing to be just you know generic and the same. So I don't know. I, I never really thought about focusing on making her a sort of cut out of the Disney character at all. I actually hadn't seen the film until you know I did Skin Deep and that was kind of oh cool I'll do an episode because I love you guys and you know from Lost Adam and Eddie awesome and then it you know it turned into this this season um, which I'm you know couldn't be happier about but um, yeah I, I consciously didn't want to be influenced by by that so it's just kind of creating as you go and feeling it out yeah and working with you know amazing people doesn't hurt You know, honestly, okay, if I, I'm going to go with the bell thing, because that's just easier. Bell's moments. Breaking the teacup and throwing it. <laughs> I mean, God, that's just, yeah, I cried. And they're like, you're not meant to be sad, you don't like him. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. And it is broken, like we can't, like the actual cup is broken. And she got really depressed about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I mean, if she if she got that much out of him in Fairy Tale Land when he was green, I think she can do it again. Yeah. And what is your message for the fans as they head into these final episodes of the season? Just hope you enjoy it. We are having a ton of fun doing it, and I think there's going to be some really cool surprises that people will like. So. Oh! I'm playing the evil queen. <laughs> I never wanted to play Snow White. I've always been a fan of the villains in Disney films. When you watch these animated movies, they're always quite animated, big. I really wanted to keep her human. And so working with the real human emotions helped support the character for me. I may only be your mother through marriage, but I'm here for you, dear. The original movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, I didn't use a lot of that. What I did use mostly of is like it's a bit of Ursula. You know, the the big body <laughs> and the laughter. <laughs> Certain scenes require that kind of big animation and then some don't. 
Catherine was supposed to die and Mary Margaret was to take the blame. We may create the character, we may come up with the idea of the character, but the actors have to bring it to life. Uh, season two is about to end. That must be really exciting. <laughs> it is. So uh, the queen is caught between a rock and a hard place, between Henry pulling her on the side of good and her mom pulling her on the side of evil. Must be fun to play as an actress, right? Oh yeah, she's multi, multi, you know, layered and colorful, and it's fantastic. It's, it's, it, I can't get bored playing her. And what do you think exemplifies a once upon a time moment? Uh, I mean, I, I guess any any moment when you see, you know, two people that love each other kiss, because that's it's the ultimate, you know, happy ending, I guess. This January, get hooked. As in Captain Hook? Ah, so you've heard of me. You care to join me for a drink? Television's most charming new villain. Thank you, my lady. Once Upon a Time. All new episodes begin Sunday, 8, 7 central on ABC. Hook, what's coming up for him to see this uh, final episodes of the season? Well, uh, I can't say exactly, but he's definitely, you get to see his sort of interaction with the people of Storybrooke and how... You know, you get to see some good stuff with Hook, I think, towards the end of the season, yeah. And uh, what is for you a once upon a time moment? <laughs> for me, I'll tell you exactly what it was. Uh, and it was the first day shooting. And we were shooting on, on the Lady Washington, which was the uh, Jolly Roger. And uh, we weren't shooting at the time. And I was just standing there in my pirate outfit. And I was, I was looking at the mountains go past. And we were on a pirate ship. And I was like, this is surreal. You know, <laughs> I was just sort of standing there going, this is crazy. So that's, uh, I guess that's my once upon a time moment. And uh, lastly, uh, what's your message for the fans of the show as they get ready to watch the rest of the season? Uh, well, my message is that I, well, I hope, I hope you all like it, still like it. I hope you like Hook and just keep an eye out and see, uh, just you get to see some interesting stuff with him. So. Johanna. Oh, oh, your majesty. Oh, please forgive me. I just wanted to see... You. How dare you? Yes, I play again Snow White. Previous episodes have opened with, you know, how Regina and Snow met and, and how, you know, Regina became Snow's mother. And um, and she's a really fun character to play because she shows, you know, the vulnerability of, of her losing her mom and how she really does care about Regina and how she does want the best for her, which I think is a really important piece because sometimes, you know, you can wonder, what did she do and, and what made Regina dislike her so much? That's mine! It's not for a servant. It was my mistake. I'm a huge fan of Jennifer, and I loved her work, and I've always wanted to work with her. I walked on set, and I was like, hi, Jenny. And she's like, hi, I'm so excited. You're so beautiful. I was like, thank you. You're stunning. Oh, Bailey is stunning. I've, I've not been joking when I have tweeted things such as I would like to take acting lessons from her. I think that she's incredibly gifted. Uh, wise beyond her years, and her work is so grounded and complicated and beautiful. Enough. I'm sorry, you might just... No. I was talking to Snow. Everyone was saying that. Like, you look so much like, and I was like, I can't just look like her. Like, I have to act like her. So um, so they were kind enough. I asked if they could send me some clips. Me? I thought I raised you better than that, Snow. And I literally sat there like it was a book report every day, and I had, like, a week to do it. And, like, I took the, the videos, and I'd pause the screen, and then take, like, a screenshot of, like, how she, like, crushed her eyebrows or, like, how she moved her eyes or her lips. I was told that she watched an awful lot of my footage uh, and I couldn't have told you why she seemed so similar to me but my friends watching the show were all aghast it doesn't matter whether one is a servant or royalty everyone in the kingdom deserves our love and respect I mean they were gasping left and right that's a Ginnyism that's a Ginnyism that's something that you do and things that I'm not aware of that I do that she picked up on she apologized if you look on my desktop it looks like I'm like a stalker because there's like a whole file that says Snow White and it's like all of her facial expressions and like the way that she speaks and like her voice it's really funny if you looked at it it'd be like Bailey Madison stalk Shutter for Goodwin but I thought we were royals we are but that doesn't make us better than anyone else Welcome to Storybook. She has a destiny. Open your eyes.
Everyone needs you. You're our only hope. We knew when we wrote the pilot and it was picked up that, that costumes would be very important for the show. We did not want to have it look like a Renaissance fair. We wanted it to look like an Alexander McQueen show. The wardrobe in Once Upon a Time, I think, is pretty amazing. Uh, we're so lucky to have Eduardo Castro as our designer. He's Emmy Award nominee for the show. The thing that's so great about him is he actually designs these costumes. I'm one of the few designers left that does their own drawings, and they serve as an inspiration for a jumping off point. I think that's where Eduardo's genius is, in that he sketches, and that he can understand what we're saying, and it really has such a distinct and great vision for these costumes. Say I'll email a drawing of, say, Captain Hook to uh, Eddie and Adam. We wanted a different kind of Captain Hook than you've ever seen before. We just wanted it more in a rock and roll vein, so we started sending him pictures of, like, Jimi Hendrix and Adam Ant and all these different things, and then Eduardo came up with the long leather trench coat and the vest, and he just really dialed into it. And it's, I think, the first time that we've seen Captain Hook portrayed totally all in black. Well, my man is, we haven't been formally introduced. Killian Jones. We on purpose avoided any embroidery. It's all very simple. It's all very super sleek. <laughs> Rumpelstiltskin was one of the first costumes we made because it was one of the first castings that we made, which was played by Robert Carlyle. Always nice to make an impression. Where are my manners? We haven't been properly introduced. Rumpelstiltskin. Well, did the Castro and his team do an absolutely fantastic job, you know, and, and they, they do look sumptuous. <laughs> they look like, to me, what I would expect to see in a feature, you know, and a big feature at that. Bobby is such a great actor, and what's great is Bobby has such great movements when he is Rumpelstiltskin. That wardrobe that Eduardo picks for him allows him to move and do those hand gestures and the way he kind of moves about. How do I bring my son back to slay the dragon? bring him back. Oh no, that's out of the question. He's dead. Magic can do much, but know that. And our producer, uh, creator, Eddie Kitsis, had one sentence to say to me, and he said, make him a rock star. <laughs> and with that in mind, we found some uh, incredible skins of uh, leather, some faux, some real. Uh, we draped it across an arm, and I said, oh my god, he's a living crocodile. I was wrong. Not a rat at all. More more like a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of it, the way it all, it's all put together, it does help. When I put that on, it kind of it tightens me up for a start. And the collar thing that sticks out at the, the top, these little wings, it sort of gives me a kind of otherworldly look. And I absolutely love it. Something's missing. The interesting thing about Prince Charming's wardrobe is we had no idea where we were going <laughs> for the first pilot. My assistant brought in this panel of Swarovski beading and we just placed it across the mannequin and I said, that's it, that's it. And we paired it with black leather pants, black boots, a sword belt, and it's really quite simple when you see it, but it's rather striking. And Josh actually was perfect in working with it. 
and I think it takes someone of great taste to be able to go through all the hundreds of years of different artists interpretations of fairy tale costumes and what these characters look like and be able to make it new make it cool and make it cinematic and I think he does that across the board and yeah they're fantastic no more deals there was one costume that Eddie and Adam and all the producers in the network just loved and that was his brown leather doublet it just says everything that we want to say about Prince Charming it just seems to work and to you Snow White Snow White's wedding dress was the very first dress that we designed for the series I now pronounce you husband and why? We found this yardage in Los Angeles, and I unrolled the feathers, and I said, what do you think about this for the wedding dress? And everybody said, it's perfect, it's perfect, just use it. Every gown is essentially couture, and so much thought goes into each and every detail. For Snow White, we've always developed each of her costumes with ivory in mind and textures in mind that are very simple and organic. We try very, very hard to keep a romanticism in there. It's the queen. Run! She's not a queen anymore. I think the evil queen really is one of the most fun characters to work on and certainly one of the most special. We have many different stages of her. There's the stages where she's the queen and before she's full evil. And then we have the stages when she is full evil. And then we have right before the curse. And it's keeping the timelines correct, but also kind of tracking the character emotionally with the wardrobe. And if we can do that right, then every time you're watching the show, you can on almost a subconscious level know where you are just by how the character is dressed. From the very first time I saw Lana, we just understood where we were going. And the very first time I had my network meeting, I just threw out the idea of leather pants and they all jumped and said yes yes let's do leather pants it's so important to, to really have the actor in tune with what you're doing he and I sit down and talk about these costumes from very early on where were we the Queen's costumes have allowed me to really, really utilize my imagination, and it's one of the most fun characters to work on. Every episode, every wardrobe fitting, I end up saying, this is now my favorite costume, this is my favorite costume. I think they're all fantastic. Redwater is just amazing. Everything is just perfectly made, like there's not one stitch that's out of place. I don't know how they do it. And they make these in like three days. Every episode I say this is my favorite costume. Eduardo is a genius. He finds a way to express all of our characters very definitively through costumes. We are allowed to proceed with magic and hopefully it turns out that way on the screen. So uh, season two about to end. Really exciting stuff. Really exciting stuff. It's always exciting to uh, you know come to the end of a season. You know the first season was exciting, and this one's going to be just as exciting, even more. It's going to keep pushing that envelope. Got it. And what do you think is so? What can you tease about what's coming up for Prince Charming? Uh, you know Prince Char. <laughs> Prince Charming is, you know, what you would expect. He is now that he knows who he is. He's the hero. He's the leader. He is like a compass. You know, he is true north, and uh, he will point everybody in the right direction, and he will do what he can because he is the leader to help everyone out. So people come to him throughout the rest of the series to get, to, you know, to get his help. And, you know, that's, you know, kind of his bur uh, burden and kind of his curse at the same time. So his kind of hopes and dreams are kind of pushed to the side a little bit why he helps everyone else. But, you know, there's still this hope that uh, he's going to get back to his kingdom, that he's going to rebuild it, that he's going to make that land better than it ever was. And I think that's, that's his dream and that's where his focus is right at the moment. Now, maybe some things will happen that, you know, kind of stop that dream, but you'll have to tune in and see. Do you have a message for the fans as they head into uh, these final episodes? Uh, just hold on to your seats. Well, Jennifer, they, they teased us with uh, Sheriff Graham earlier this season, you know, gave us a, a few episodes with him, then yanked him away from you. They yanked him away from Mayor Regina, who probably enjoyed having the boy toy and everything. Yeah, any, any, a replacement. Any, 
<laughs> Getting lonely in Storybrooke. <laughs> well, I think I, that's what I liked about the character, about having him with Regina, was it showed that she's got base needs just like anybody else. Sure, sure does. <laughs> I would say, uh, I would say uh, that Regina has a lot of base needs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any plans to have Jamie Dornan back? We have some volunteers. Back? We love <laughs> Well, uh, you know, Jamie may have had his heart ripped out in Storybrooke, but he is still very much alive when we go back to fairy tale land. So who knows? I'd keep watching. Yeah. Our next section is fashion. I got some reader questions here. Uh, Eliza <laughs> wants to know, Jennifer, are we ever going to see Emma in a dress again? Maybe at a Storybrook ball. <clears throat> um, well, again? Uh, you wear a lot of jeans. dress at all? In Just the pilot. when I, pilot. In the pilot, pilot when I was dressing oh, as right, someone yeah. else. Oh, that was sexy. She's going to have a leather jacket dress. <laughs> um, a leather dress. Yeah, maybe a leather dress. <laughs> be like her dad. It'd be like her dad. Aww. Make a red leather dress. Yeah. And then a blue leather dress. Yeah. And then a brown leather dress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Throwing a black one every once in a while. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, we. Uh, she's she's not a big dress girl, but I feel like, you know, that this season uh, is it, it. There's so much hitting her right now in terms of her starting to feel emotions that she's never felt before because she's been so closed off her whole life, and um, you know, so much changes for her so quickly. Now having Henry back in her life and, and having a friend for the first time in her life and having to deal with having, feeling vulnerable basically for the first time. And um, I think, you know, hopefully, as you said, if we get a second season and things continue, I think that you will see how she dresses and how she carries herself change as she starts to open up more. I think that that will always, her emotional journey will be reflected in some ways through what she's wearing. Okay. And Jennifer, I've got Lauren wondering, do you like Mary Margaret's style? I do. I really do. Um, we, I feel like we walk this fine line of trying to bring in something timeless. And we used Jean Seberg at this point mm -hmm. as an inspiration. But we also have to keep her from having a sense of, a real sense of style, because that would imply a real sense of self. Mm -hmm. And that's something that separates Mary Margaret from Snow White. But I still do have a lot of fun with, with those costume pieces, for sure. And Robert, you're not getting out of this particular topic. I've got uh, Cyprith wondering, what is the name of the nail polish color <laughs> that Rumpelstiltskin own, wears? My own personal. Uh, I don't know. It's the, 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 the nails come pre-made. They, they come in pre-made. And I think they're the kind of uh, greeny black kind of color. Little bits of gold. In it. Limey. What, what, what I believe it's called color? Broken Pops. Soul. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, how, how long is that whole process? The hair, the teeth, the um, skin, the The whole glitter? thing, uh, the, the, the makeup itself takes just under two hours to do, and then um, it takes an hour to get off at night, which is a, a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the strangest thing of all for, for people is that, you know, the, the, the boots that he wears, the leggings thing? 20 minutes. 20 minutes wow. just to lace that up. He started peeling his skin off during rehearsal once and throwing it at me. It was really upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to sell it on eBay. So it's... <laughs> it's one of those things where you're like, I know it's fake, I know it's fake, but that's really gross. Like, it's... <laughs> now, our last question for this portion of the panel, I've got uh, Cordy wondering if there's, wants to put out the question, if there's any other character you could play on the show, who would you want to play? So let's start with you, since you basically play a, a, a mere mortal. Um, Who would you like to play on the show? That's a really, I would probably say Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> Josh approves. <laughs> Why, because he's got swagger? Or? Well, I, you know, I want to, like, go fight things and swing swords and ride horses and, you know, that's... You, know, you guys are that. Twinkies today. We are oh. kind of Twinkies, aren't we? Oh. I like it. Uh, Jack, Jack of the Beanstalk, I think I would really like to play. Oh, okay. He's not on the show. I know. Oh, you mean on the show now? <laughs> maybe, oh, no, I, maybe I heard you know something else. Too. I thought I was you meant like the character we hadn't character. yet. On the show now. Uh, Rumple, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I would just get to come to work looking like me. <laughs> Raphael, what about you? Uh, the Evil Queen. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of revelation for Rumple Stillskin, um, a new family member, so to speak. So, uh, how's that going to evolve for the rest of the season? Oh God, it's, it's it's really huge kind of ramifications about this now. That uh, Henry, as the seer has said, 
there is the boy is going to be your undoing. So this is what's playing through Gold's head, you know, all the time now. And um, whether that's true or not, it's a different thing. It might not be that boy. See, we always have to listen to the words in Once Upon a Time. But the moment that's the way we have to play it, that it is that boy. So what I can say without giving too much away is that, you know, Henry's in danger now. Anyone who, who's an enemy of Gold's in danger. So similarly, even though he's only a kid, <laughs> he's in danger. In your mind, what exemplifies a Once Upon a Time moment? Oh, that's an interesting question. That is, I think, uh, I think, I think taking you along a road, a well-trodden path that you think you know, and then suddenly taking a U-turn. I think that's what does it. You know, like for instance, I can talk uh, personally my own character. Last season, it, it wasn't uh, the fairy godmother who sent Cinderella to the ball. It was Rumpelstiltskin. So you think you know these stories, but they'll take them somewhere else. Similarly, uh, in episode sixteen, coming up, the miller's daughter with Rose McGowan, she plays the young Cora. Um, he, he, rather than, you know, it's, uh, the whole thing about the Rumpelstiltskin story was if you guess my name, I'll let you off with the deal. The very first scene that they play in The Miller's Daughter, he gives him the name. She says, why are you telling me your name? He says, because you've earned it. And that brings them very, very close, closer than you can imagine. Red, no, Red, it's me, don't, don't, please, Red. No! Wolf's time or not, you won't hurt anyone tonight. Maybe. But I can't afford to take any chances. You know, there's a tragedy to Red. This is a woman who has a part of her, this wolf part, that she has to kind of tame and control, and in the process of doing it, there was much tragedy. Red eating her true love is a pretty traumatic thing. It's not something that happens every day, and I think that Red, before that, she was so innocent and sort of naive and hopeful and trusting of the world and things working out, and I feel like after that happens, it's so traumatizing to her. It's such a huge thing to have happen. Who's Peter? He wasn't the wolf. It's me. Go. Go like this. You have to. It's going to be okay. No time. Red is a character who thought she was a monster and then learned to embrace that and realized she was both. But I think there's a part of her that feels like she's different from everyone, even though she's included. You're not the first to learn the truth about yourself through tragedy. So many of us spend so much of our life suppressing the wolf. They have no idea how to control it. You can teach me to do that. Indeed, I can. The contrast of her experience with dealing with the wolf is very interesting. The fact that she can control it, I think, is also interesting because it sort of shows that she has integrated it more into herself. If you give in to the wolf, you'll realize the truth. You are the wolf. She's very protective of the people that she cares about. I think that's something that really drives her. Goodbye, Mother. Snow believes in her, and Snow accepts her for who she is. I'm so sorry. One of my favorite moments is when she said, you know, I know how hard it is to lose your family, and Red says I protected it. I know what it's like to lose your family. I didn't lose my family today. I protected it. Almost ending. Yeah. Uh, what can you tease about what's coming up? New characters? 
We'll see um, maybe one or two, but really they'll be in a supportive role. Uh, the end of the season is really about the core characters that we've set up in the beginning of the year and kind of uh, watching them deal with uh, crisis after crisis. And what would you say typifies a once upon a time moment? Oh, uh, I think, you know, what a choice. You know, usually characters have to make a choice, their best interest versus the right thing to do. And finally, uh, do you guys have a message for the fans of this series as they're ready to watch the final episodes of the season? I'd say, well, first, thank you for watching. And, you know, we, we really, really appreciate the support. And we really, we're doing this for you. And we hope you like where we're going. Yeah. Oh, hi. I didn't see you come in. Believe me, living in a small town like Storybrooke, well, it can be very hard to find your happily ever after. That's why I created Singlebrook for people like us. Why don't you look through our dating profiles and maybe you can find that charming someone who can bring the magic back. I sure would like a little magic back in my life. Is this about dating? What do I want in a partner? Well, I don't need a prince. Dark hair, red lips, skin white as, I don't know what, milk? I, you know, 5'10 minimum, sensible face. No stuck-ups. She's milk white. Is that racist? No prudes. She should, like, go. Come to think of it, a prince sounds pretty nice. <sighs> Gee, I don't know what I want. You want me to describe myself? Tough, but fair. I'm just a small town girl. I'm just an ordinary guy. Sassy. Mm -hmm. Very fair. I guess I'm sort of a, a lone wolf. Symmetrical. I'm like... Absolutely symmetrical. In these veins, uh, there is hot Italian blood, the blood of Romeo, of, of, of Casanova. The situation, eh? The fairest, really. Perfect day? Check. Bowling. We could hang with, like, say, six of my friends. The movies. Yeah, a snack and a DVD. Crying over the bodies of dead wildlife. <sighs> Every lucky lady will get a dinner at Granny's a single carnation, and a visit to my condo where I will play the very best of Sting and the sparks will fly. Recently I felt this emptiness here. I know I'll find him someday. I just hope I know her when I see her. I hear magic is back. Well, that would certainly spice up a date.